Peter holds the metal tray with flowers painted on it, and a smug look appears on his face as he claims that the piece of metal will be just enough for him to take on Park Sangdo. When the overconfident villain sees this, he's quite confused as to why Peter thinks he can use a tray to win. So he laughs and begins to tease him, because he finds the whole situation amusing and hilarious. After laughing hysterically, Sango admits that it's been a while since he's teared up while laughing. Even though he seems to be in a good mood, he reminds our hero that he won't go easy on him during their fight. While he's still saying this, he lunges at Peter with his curved blade, and attempts to land a powerful slash. But thankfully, the ex-assassin is fast enough to dodge it. Sango continues his barrage of slash attacks on the MC, but he uses the metal tray as a shield to block them. The crazy villain notices that this is what Peter is doing, and he admits that it's not a bad idea at all, but then he asks him how many more attacks he thinks the tray can take. Sango jokingly asks if the tray can take 10 more hits, but quickly predicts that it can't. So instead, he decides to see if the tray can even withstand one more powerful attack. Just when he's about to land the devastating blow, the scene shifts, and we see the instructor driving as fast as he can to get to them, because he doesn't want the students to suffer the same thing that happened to him. In other words, he doesn't want the assassin to cut off their legs. He refuses to let the past repeat itself, believing that he can't lose them to Park Sangdo. The scene shifts once more, and we see a flashback of the kidnapper in question, talking with a terrified woman and trying to calm her down so she doesn't panic. The woman appears to be a dealer, and as usual, Park Sango suggests that they make a bet. He asks her if she thinks he can walk out of this place dead or alive, and of course, the woman hesitates to take the bet or answer him. But he tempts her again by calling her smart, and urges her to pick the option of his survival without doubt. Just then, we see that there are other scary men in suits holding chainsaws, and standing behind Park Sangdo, but he doesn't even seem bothered by them at all. While he's chatting with the scared woman, one of the men finally confronts him and informs him that the company has been troubled by the many incidents he's caused. So, in order to quell the external rage, he is to be sacrificed. The leader of the Chainsaw Assassins informs Sango that he's been fired, and immediately, he and his men charge at the outcast. These guys were actually the group of veteran assassins who had a B rank in the organization, and they're no pushovers in any way, so Sango taking on five of them alone was considered a suicide mission. However, after seeing the rogue assassin's knife skills, one of the five B-rank killers started to believe that Sango had exceeded human limits. And as he gets his leg chopped off by the insanely killed knife user, he had already died as a killer. At that moment, it didn't matter whether a chainsaw or a knife was stronger, but the only important thing was just how monstrous the person holding the weapon was. And let me tell you, Sango with his blades was truly ferocious. The flashback ends, and we resume Peter's battle against the legendary rogue assassin, only to find out that Sango has split the tray with his knife. The two fighters take a breather, and he tells Peter how lucky he is that the knife didn't hit him. But he also points out that his only shield, which was supposed to be enough, has now been split into two. So he teases him about it, and while that's happening, Li Yuna notices and decides that she has to help Peter. As she tries to get back up with her knife, the brave hero casually engages Sango, asking him about his knife, and pointing out that it's not supposed to be used so ferociously. All of a sudden, our Peter punches the pieces of the tray, and shapes them, leaving Li Yuna shocked as she realizes that the tray wasn't a shield after all. And while she stares at him in confusion, Peter thanks Sango for giving him a weapon, because that's what the tray was intended for this whole time. At this point, the knife user laughs nervously, and admits that Peter might not be such an ordinary student after all. But while he pretends to be unfazed on the outside, he wonders how the hero survived his attack, because he thought he had cut him when he sliced the tray in two. He's baffled by it, because at the moment he thought he cut Peter, he suddenly backed off with the speed of light. And as a result, he didn't only save himself, but he also got himself two weapons out of the tray. Sango doesn't understand, because it all doesn't make sense, so he starts to wonder if Peter is even a student at all. But rather than showing his worries and fears, he hides them behind his facade of being a vicious killer. Now, he takes off his jacket to show that he means business. And as he does, he admits to our hero that he doesn't know where he learned his skills and tricks, but he assures him that they won't work on him before tossing the jacket at him. Sango charges at Peter, desperate to confirm whether he has been holding his own by coincidence or by skill. And as the jacket covers the hero's face and line of sight, the master of knives unleashes several powerful slashes on him in one go. He lands the hits and becomes confident that he was right about Peter just being a lucky kid, because this time... He's certain that he cut him with the knife. But suddenly, he senses something, and realizes that what he actually cut was a cushion, which our hero used to protect himself. Before Sango can put all the pieces together, Peter suddenly creeps up on him from behind and attempts to cut him, but the kidnapper somehow manages to block the attack. He falls to the ground and looks at the fresh cut on his hand which he used to block the attack, and he begins to fear that he's going to die. Sango thinks about how Peter was able to get behind him in an instant before going straight for his neck, 
and even though he managed to block it, he knows that he was aiming for his carotid artery. At this point, he's almost completely certain that the man standing in front of him isn't a student at all. He finally realizes that because the tray can't cut through his clothing or even withstand the attacks from his knife, Peter is now going for his exposed neck to deliver a killing blow. While he's still thinking about this, the legendary killer Peter lunges at him once more and begins to attack the kidnapper with blistering speed that he can't even keep up with. Now, the question on his mind isn't even whether Peter is a student or not, because he's no longer sure that he's even a human being. Liuna watches from the sidelines as the fight rages on and thinks about how the weight of the knife causes things around to get destroyed each time it's swung, and as such, she concludes that even a single hit from it will definitely kill a person. However, she notices that the kidnapper is slower than Peter and assumes that it's probably the Kukri's weight that's slowing him down. In other words, she believes that if the fight goes on much longer, then Peter will win for sure. But before she's even done conceiving this thought, a red line appears on the hero's face because he's been hit. Li Yuna gasps in shock upon seeing this and almost can't believe it. But while she's shaken by the new development, Sangdo regains his confidence and begins talking about how he just needs the right knife to kill someone like Peter. In another surprising twist, it turns out that Sango has knives inside the kukris he was using to fight before. So as he pulls them out, Peter sees it and realizes that because he's no longer using a heavier weapon, Sango will become faster and his speed advantage will be lost. Of course, this realization makes Peter panic, but while he's in this state of fear, Sango leaps at him, pointing the smaller knives forward to take his life. Even though our hero manages to block the attacks and hold his own against the ferocious knife user, Li Yuna immediately notices that her friend is now at a disadvantage because the crazy kidnapper becomes significantly faster. He even looks like he's a completely different person, but Yuna also notices something very strange about his style of fighting. She's currently very sure that the gimlet Sangdo is using as a stabbing weapon, so seeing him swinging it around makes her very concerned and confused. While she ponders deeply on this, the fight goes on, and we see the knife user going even harder than before, because now, he's even more desperate to kill our hero. He finally gets an opportunity to do this when he points to Peter's neck, but just when he should be delivering the killing blow, his hand suddenly becomes weak, causing the gimlet to fall to the ground. As this happens, Sango can't even believe his eyes, and he thinks that it's impossible because he has no idea why the knife would fall out of his hand. Peter, who doesn't seem surprised, casually asks the knife user if he can't put strength into his hand. Sango just stands there with his head low, and after a brief moment of silence, he reveals that he now understands what Peter has been doing from the start. It's at this moment that he realizes that our boy wasn't even going for his neck earlier, because in reality, he had always been aiming for his hands from the start. This shocking revelation is confirmed when we see Sango's hand covered in cuts. And seeing how weak he's become, he asks Peter what he did to his hand. You'd think our hero is a doctor or something, when he coldly reveals that he's cut everything Sango needs to use his hand from the flexor, extensor, and abductor muscles, along with his median, radial, and ulnar nerves, to all the ligaments in the hand. It turns out that Peter used the sharp edges of the tray to do this, and then he reveals that from the beginning, he had no plan to kill the crazy kidnapper. However, Sango's pride doesn't allow him to take this, and he refuses to accept the defeat from the person he still considers a young and experienced student. The longer he looks at Peter, the more terrified he becomes of him, and he starts to wonder just how many people our hero must have devoured in his lifetime. Of course, Peter decides to finish the fight, so first he reminds Sango of what he said about a nickel tray not being able to defeat a cast iron knife. Then, he takes a fighting stance and promises to show the crazy kidnapper how an egg destroys a rock. The next thing we see is a flashback scene, where a group of older guys are looking down at someone and laughing, because they find his situation amusing. We then find out that the person they're laughing at is a young boy tied upside down to a tree, and they appear to be the ones who put him there judging by how badly they're treating him. They literally piss on the boy's face and laugh at him while asking him if it's yummy or if he wants to drink some more. But the boy is too tired to even say a word, so he just looks at them while they continue to abuse him. This sad scene is actually a memory from Park Sango's childhood, so it's no wonder he grew up to be such a psycho. Every day, he thought about killing the bastards who abused him, but unfortunately, he didn't have the physical strength or even the courage to go up against them. So, he just continued to suck it up each time, till they had enjoyed themselves and decided to leave him for the day. That was Sango's everyday life, until one day, there was an incident that completely awakened him to a different world. It all started the day one of the bullies took Sango to a room and started tormenting him with ferocious dogs. The terrified kid begs him not to let the dogs get closer to him, but the bully just taunts him and promises not to bully him anymore if he can win a little game. At that moment, Sango knew that the guy was lying, and he even started to wish he would just die so he wouldn't have to endure the torture coming his way. But while he was still praying to the gods to take his life, the bully suddenly asks him if he wants to make a bet. And in that moment, Sango's villain arc began. Hearing this question, the scared kid's heart jolted, 
but even though he had already been cornered by the dangerous canines, his legs started moving on their own. He didn't understand what was going on, but suddenly, he charged at the dogs and knocked them out of the way, before hurling himself at his oppressor while wearing an absolutely psychotic look on his face. As Sango became possessed, he realized something that day, and it's the fact that bets with his life on the line make him stronger. From that day onward, he was no longer the scared little kid who got peed on by older kids, but he became an absolute killing machine, with knife-fighting skills that were unmatched and unfathomable. Adrenaline, serotonin, and dopamine consumed him whenever he bet his life. And as he fought and killed, he started to feel the strange yet pleasant feeling of power. Sango was unstoppable, and that was when he realized that bets were his drugs, because they made him feel alive. He always won the bets that had his life on the line, and of course, he was also always the strongest in any fight. In other words, this bloodthirsty limb cutter had never lost a fight. And so, to see this new student beat him over and over made him very confused. We catch up in the present where Peter is trying to show the betting man how, metaphorically speaking, a rock can be destroyed by an egg. Anyways, the first thing he does to make his point is to wrap the metal tray on his fist like a boxing glove, before landing a killer uppercut on Sango's jaw. Of course, the impact from the punch is enough to send him flying, and at the same time, the force causes our hero's new metal glove to fall off. As Sango collapses, his fear and desperation increase, because now, he's finding it difficult to believe what's happening to him. He's in denial because he doesn't remember the last time he lost a fight, but unfortunately for him, he's not the hero of this story. At this point, Peter is leaping into the air to end the long fight for good. But just then, Sango yells at him not to come closer and holds a grenade in his hand. Now, he believes he has the upper hand, so he commands our hero to kneel and threatens to blow everything and everyone around with the powerful explosive. To make his threat heavier, he reveals to a perplexed Peter that the suitcases contain the children he kidnapped, and these are the children our hero has been searching for, especially since President Choi Yu Cheng's son is among them too. Li Yuna is gobsmacked upon realizing that the sick bastard stuffed people inside the suitcases like sardines, but what's worse is the fact that if the grenade blows up, then all those innocent people will be history. Determined to strike fear into the heart of our hero, Sango reveals that there's a gas pipeline on top of the roof, and assures him that any explosion that ensues will leave no survivors. So because he's still certain that he has the upper hand, he desperately commands Peter to kneel before him if he doesn't want to die. However, as you'd expect, our boy isn't a beta. He boldly challenges Sango to blow up the place, but it's not going to be that easy. Because before the kidnapper can even blink, Peter appears in front of him, grabs the grenade, and then stuffs it inside his mouth. Sango is horrified and stunned when he realizes what just happened, and to make things worse for him, Peter pulls the pin on the grenade and presses it against Sango's face to prevent it from blowing up immediately. Now, he explains to the terrified kidnapper that he just pulled the pin and tells him to clamp his mouth shut if he doesn't want it to blow up in his face. Peter does this, and then proceeds to show Sango what a real threat looks like by punching him in the gut with great force, making it even harder for him to keep the grenade clamped down. Our hero unleashes heavy blow after blow, and Sango desperately holds the grenade in his mouth, even though he probably feels like puking his internal organs out. Just when he thinks the onslaught is over, Peter cocks his elbow again, and unloads another skull-cracking punch on the kidnapper's head, causing him to fall to the ground. At this point, Sango is displaying an incredible showcase of willpower, because he still has the grenade in his mouth. But just looking at his bloody face and teary eyes, you can tell that this is the most physical and emotional pain he's felt in a very long time. While he's groaning and wincing on the floor, Peter suddenly decides that he's had enough, especially since he bit down on the grenade very well. So, he puts the pin back in, and then tells Sango to get up and stop being a crybaby. However, we quickly find out that Peter is just giving the kidnapper a breather because he's not done pummeling him so quickly. Our hero takes the grenade and holds it in one hand, while he prepares the other bloody fist for some more abuse. And at this point, Sango gets back on his feet and starts trying to say something. After stuttering for a bit, he finally gets his tongue under control and threatens Peter again, telling him that he has a secret trump card he didn't want to use before. But now, he's changed his mind. Of course, when Li Yuna hears this, she begins to panic again, afraid of what sinister plans and tricks the psycho knife user might have under his sleeves. However, her fears turn out to be very unnecessary, because we quickly find out that Sango's secret plan is unbelievably pathetic. The big mouth guy suddenly falls to his knees, and as tears roll down his cheeks, he begs Peter to end the fight, and call it a draw. He continues the embarrassing act, and claims that he'll pretend he never fought them, vowing to also release every single person he kidnapped and stuffed in a suitcase. Sango finishes making the promises, and then continues to beg them shamelessly to end the fight. But while he's busy embarrassing himself, the instructor barges into the place, not knowing that the threat is no longer scary in any way at all. Just when the weeping kidnapper is about to make another promise, he sees the man, and as they make eye contact, they're both shocked for some reason. 
Well, in the instructor's case, we can understand his confusion because he's looking at the fearless, unbeatable, and vicious killer who once chopped off his leg, now kneeling and begging shamelessly to be spared. As you'd expect, the senior is pretty shocked to see all his students with complete sets of limbs, but Peter just ignores the look of confusion on his face and picks up the unconscious Doco brothers, preparing to leave. The whole kidnap incident finally ends, and while the president's son and other hostages are rescued, Sangdo is placed in a body bag. The people in charge of transporting him are disappointed to see the infamous Park Sangdo crying and begging like a baby, so they ignore all the rumors they ever heard about him and ship him off to Glory's headquarters. The instructor reminisces about the incident, and is sure that the nightmare that ended his life as a killer is no more. But as he looks at the Dako brothers taking credit for the win, he still can't believe that his young student handled the situation. Even though the instructor finds the whole story questionable, he decides to let it slide because Peter already said he wasn't responsible for the victory. The scene shifts, and we see that the four students became official killers shortly after defeating Sangdo. But the Dako brothers complain when they see that they are only rank D, because they believe they should be higher than that after defeating an S-rank killer. Peter and Lee Yuna tell them to shut it, and ask them to focus on their latest mission. The elevator door opens, and as the brothers are praying they don't die on the mission, they're suddenly interrupted when they see two very muscular women standing in front of them. The terrified brothers frantically push the buttons to close the doors, thinking that they're on the wrong floor. But when a stunning woman in the same uniform appears and introduces herself, they become infatuated on the spot. The woman tells them that she's been expecting the four of them, and we see her leading them into the expensive building, while informing them that the president is greatly interested in them since they saved his son. As a result, he's instructed that they be taken good care of, with more food than their tummies can take, and new high-quality suits. Not surprisingly, the brothers are really excited by the fact that the president knows them, but while they're still daydreaming, the hostess calls their attention, telling them that the treats aren't over yet. She then opens a giant door and reveals the ammunition paradise behind it. If this isn't John Wick, I don't know what else could possibly qualify. The Dia Group owns the best weaponry in the world, and as the major sponsor of the Glory Killers, the president has decided to reward them with all the weapons they want. Immediately, the brothers stuff their clothes with all the weapons they can fit, so the shocked hostess informs them that their selected weapons will be delivered to them later. Meanwhile, Li Yuna is overwhelmed by the quality of knives. In her heart, she also feels guilty for not being able to help Peter in their fight against Sangdo, and thinks she has no right to take any weapons. On the other hand, Peter, who's already used all the other weapons, simply picks a fountain pen, leaving the nosy host as shocked that he isn't as greedy as the others. And afterward, she breaks the other students' hearts by informing them that they've been instructed to escort only Peter to see the president. Before entering the elevator, she makes small talk with Peter and is shocked when he reveals that he's used the older model of the fountain pen, which was made over 40 years ago. Our hero quickly realizes he just set himself up, so he tells her that the pen was passed down to him. But of course, the hostess tries to get even more nosy, which forces him to change the topic and ask her why the president wants to see him. The lady claims that she doesn't know and suggests him to ask the president directly. And with that short answer, their conversation ends on the spot. Soon, they arrive at the president's office, who tells the hostess to excuse him and his guests for some privacy. The woman leaves, and after that, we finally get to see the face behind the name, Choi Yucheng, who is the president of the world's strongest military enterprise. Choi asks Peter if he enjoyed the food and how he likes his new clothes. And of course, our hero answers politely, thanking him at the same time. Then, he goes straight to the point and asks Choi why he summoned him, but the president just laughs and claims that it's because he wanted to meet him. Of course, Peter is smart enough to figure that this isn't the only reason. And sure enough, Choi suddenly reveals that he actually had another motive for inviting him. The president walks up to our hero and addresses him by his alias, Kim Sungu, while looking him dead in the eye, before suddenly revealing that he knows his real identity. This is one heck of a twist, because so far there has been no sign that someone else would know about our hero's real identity. So, is the president bluffing? Does he have some sort of proof to back his claim? Or was he somehow involved in our hero's regression in the first place? Stay tuned to find out in the next episode. Until next time.